So, <clears throat> hello everybody. I'm very happy to be here and I'm very grateful for this kind invitation uh, to speak at the opening of this conference. It's a great uh, honor for me. Um, I'm also grateful for, for the very warm welcome here to um, uh, also to me and, and helping to solving some um, problems that Finair created for us last uh, yesterday. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, when Anna invited me uh, to talk at this conference, I think it was uh, spring last year, uh, we were all still in a kind of shock um, caused by, by the Russian invasion. And first I thought uh, the invitation is for September 22. But then she said, no, no, it's 23. And I was like, God, who knows what will happen until 23? How can you set a, a topic for, for an event which uh, is going to happen in more than one year when the fate of Ukraine is decided now, the fate of Europe, also our personal lives are in a kind of suspension and and here I am <laughs> um, in autumn 23 and I did not even change the topic I proposed <laughs> uh, which is um, a looking back on memory politics uh, and its role in the Ukrainian-Russian conflict, um, looking back um, <clears throat> Uh, so to say, to, to the history of the Ukrainian-Russian relations uh, from the Orange Revolution to the annexation of Crimea and to the most recent events. <clears throat> um, so I, I will, of course, uh, be very um, um, general uh, because you can give many lectures on this, right? But uh, um, you can um, comment and, and ask questions and I would be very happy if we would have kind of conversation after this talk. Um, so some of you know, who know me better, you know that I come from border studies uh, to memory studies, yeah, so I, I kind of um, started, uh, I was doing research on uh, uh, Ukrainian Russian borderlands, Ukrainian Polish borderlands, and I got interested in the role of memory, local memory politics in 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 um, in this border dynamics. And um, since the war uh, has started, I, I'm kind of asked to comment on memory and on borders. And every time I have to explain that this war is not about borders. It's not a territorial conflict, right? And this war is not about memory. It's not about history. It's not about how both countries see their um, common past or overlapping past. And still, of course, we all know how important um, uh, historical narratives or quasi-historical narratives in the state propaganda. And uh, uh, Putin indeed uh, used instrumentalized fa false historical narratives to legitimize Russia's special military operation in Ukraine. And we all know these narratives from the media. Um, just to remind you, like, what these kind of core sets of core narratives about Ukraine looks like uh, from the Kremlin perspective. Ukraine is an artificial state. There is no such state as Ukraine. Ukraine has never been a state. It's all a kind of construction. It was created by the Bolsheviks. It's an invention of Lenin. Um, Russians and Ukrainians are one single people. Uh, there is no cultural whatever differences between Russians and Ukrainians. Uh, also, 
Kremlin claims that uh, Russia is protecting Russian speakers from genocide of the Kiev government. We also know this narrative of genocide uh, instrumentalized by, <clears throat> by the Kremlin, and that uh, uh, Russia is protecting the peoples of Donbass. So nobody knows what kind of peoples are meant here. It's in plural often, and, and, uh, and it seems a kind of contradiction. So on the one hand, Russians and Ukrainians are one single people. On the other hand, there are some peoples of Donbass, which are part of the Russian people. So it's, it's a kind of uh, very situational combination of narratives. Uh, <clears throat> and if you try to find some consistency in, in them, you will fail. And of course, very important uh, narrative is, is that um, uh, Ukrainian radical nationalists and, and neo-Nazis are in power in Kyiv, at least since the Euromaidan. Uh, and and uh, that's why, especially in the beginning of the so-called uh, special military operation, there was this um, rhetoric we, we, of, of Moscow, we want uh, denazification of Ukraine. Um, and another, probably the last, the last one I want to mention here, Ukraine as an anti-Russian project of the West. So this is what, what is often repeated by the Russian officials. Uh, Ukraine is a kind of anti-Russia. The West created to undermine Russian civilization, Russian, um, Russian state. Um, and Russia is fighting uh, against Western liberal order in Ukraine. <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, here. so the question is, um, is it like, do they really believe in this stuff in Moscow? And it's a question which is not so easy to answer, right? Maybe we will know for sure if Putin's regime finally collapses and we will see what all these people start to, to say. <laughs> um, and to excuse themselves, maybe, or to justify themselves. But uh, uh, it seems that, that indeed, to some extent, many of, of these people and Putin himself actually believes in what he is saying. And he increasingly believes that he is a kind of historian. He started to write historical articles. One of them was um, kind of got a lot of attention. It was. Um, half a year before the full-scale invasion, the article on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, which was published in Russian and in Ukrainian on the website of the, <clears throat> of the Russian president. And Putin kind of keeps um, contributing to this image as a very also passionate historian or impatient historian. Recently, he, he commented uh, on, uh, I don't know, like uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, nationalists who killed um, one and a half million Jews in, on the territory of Ukraine. They, they did not even need Germans to do this. Um, and so he, it, it seems that he really, some, some topics are very near to his heart and he really like, uh, likes to talk about Stepan Bandera and um, so not only Putin. Um, on this photo you see um, um, uh, Vladimir Medinsky who is uh, the former Minister of Culture and now um, also, recently, he was mentioned in the context of, of a new history textbook uh, in Russia, which is a kind of obligatory history textbook, which uh, presents like the, the newest perspective on the Russian history, also including the recent chapter on the war in Ukraine. And on this photo, he's uh, honoring uh, Zoya Kosmodemyanska, who was like a Soviet uh, um, icon uh, 
of, of the memory of the Great Patriotic War, a young partisan girl uh, tortured and killed by, by the Germans and um, forgotten in somehow in the 90s, but then her cult was kind of reestablished in contemporary Russia. And it's interesting that Medinsky, for example, was uh, appointed the head of the uh, Russian delegation at negotiations with Ukraine at the very beginning of the special military operation, um, the negotiations which then were kind of abandoned. And, um, so um, if we look try to look back where all it started. It, um, actually, Ukraine and Russia in, in the 90s had other problems um, as fighting with each other about uh, history. Um, and both countries were, in a way, in a quite similar situation because they had to deal with the very recent uh, Soviet uh, um, legacy. And in Ukraine in the 90s, uh, there were kind of two competing paradigms of what independent Ukraine is. Uh, and this is maybe makes it different from the Baltic states, from Estonia. Um, these two competing paradigms was one like Ukraine as a victim of the Soviet occupation, like, like here in the Baltic states, but the other paradigm was Ukraine uh, as a successor of the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. And the Ukrainian government somehow tried to combine both narratives and both um, 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 legacies, if you wish, um, the legacy of, of the Ukrainian fight for independence, uh, the dissidents, Ukrainian nationalism, but at the same time, Soviet Ukraine as being a legitimate successor of the um, predecessor of the of the um, independent Ukraine, and it was in a way a bit similar in Russia under Yeltsin, because. Um, uh, Yeltsin denounced the totalitarian communist regime, wanted to distance from, uh, from, uh, from uh, the communist regime, and um, at the same time, uh, the um, communist party was very strong in Russia, the main competitive of Yeltsin, com um, competitive of Yeltsin and uh, they kind of, um, instrumentalizes widespread Soviet nostalgia, which uh, very quickly emerged in Russia in response to the market reforms and, and um, uh, kind of social, uh, social issues following this, these reforms. <clears throat> uh, when it really uh, started, I think many uh, scholars um, doing this um, Ukrainian and Russian memory politics would agree that the Orange Revolution was probably kind of a very important moment uh, here. Um, and uh, Ivan Krastev, a Bulgarian political scientist, called um, the Orange Revolution uh, in Ukraine, Russia, September 11. So it was a moment of kind of shock that the political elites experienced in Russia and um, uh, Moscow started to denounce um, uh, Kiev uh, government as, as fascist and started to talk about fascism in Ukraine. The narrative which has become so crucial for the Russian propaganda in the years to come. And again, here in this audience, in this city, in this country, I don't have to, to explain that this was not something really new in the Russian rhetoric, because uh, similar narratives, uh, um, similar narrative was, was used uh, by Moscow against uh, the Baltic states before, in response to, uh, um, to the politics um, 
uh, here when, when in, in uh, from the late 80s, uh, the narrative of the Soviet occupation and the anti-Soviet resistance became mainstream narrative in, in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and Moscow started kind of denouncing political elites in these countries as revisionists, radical nationalists, and Nazi sympathizers. And I'm old enough to remember how Russian media was full of this um, um, uh, insinuations um, criticizing, uh, criticizing uh, politics of the Baltic states. Uh, uh, memory politics, too. Yeah. So what, what happened with Ukraine somehow followed uh, uh, this pattern in a way. <clears throat> and of course, uh, Russia has changed under Putin, especially since his second term, a term, and especially the Orange Revolution affected Putin's attitude to Ukraine. And so Russia has experienced its, its kind of conservative turn and, and um, uh, started to use memory politics uh, for constructing a kind of alternative, Russian identity alternative to Western liberal identity, um, promoting this triumphalist memory of the victory of World War II, which um, was never totally gone, but still in the 90s was in a kind of retreat and, and under criticism. And uh, one could talk here a lot about what has changed in Russia, like uh, the state started to squeeze out independent actors from this field, and we know how it ended with the ban on memorial and other institutions which um, played important role in Russian memory politics in, in the 90s. And Soviet period started to be seen as uh, positive, and uh, the, the idea, this, this Yeltsin's kind of criticism of the Soviet regime as totalitarian was gone. And Putin, uh, for Putin, I think it's very dear, is especially this idea of reconciliation um, ending like the civil war in Russia and kind of um, uh, reconciling those who fought on the side of the Red Army and on the side of the White Army um, and kind of um, uh, claiming actually that they all wanted one great Russia in their own way. And in, in Russia there, <clears throat> there were uh, several interesting projects, uh, interesting from our academic perspective, of course, not from probably from the perspective of Russian citizens, uh, to, to reconcile these this, uh, narratives. And in Crimea, freshly annexed Crimea, the memorial the, uh, to, to the Russian reconciliation was built in Sevastopol as a kind of sign of this DM. Um, and as I said, uh, so the, the first kind of phase of, of um, memory wars between Ukraine and Russia um, came after the Orange Revolution, and two topics were especially um, kind of prominent in, in these contestations. One was the, the interpretation of the Holodomor, the, the Great Famine in Ukraine in 1932-33. Um, I don't have to, to explain here, probably you, you know this was a, a huge uh, disaster which killed uh, millions of Ukrainian uh, peasants um, due to uh, Soviet politics uh, of, of collectivization followed by actually confiscations of grain and Hunger was used as an instrument of repressions against uh, peasants unwilling to follow this collectivization path. <clears throat> and in Ukraine, the, this uh, huge trauma which was suppressed by the Soviet regime uh, 
um, became um, a subject of public debates and it um, somehow entered politics too and uh, um, since probably like the last years of perestroika already um, uh, in Ukraine uh, books were published and, and uh, testimonies collected and um, also books of Western scholars were translated uh, and uh, Holodomor be came to be commemorated on the official level um, but it was President Yushchenko who in 2006 suggested uh, a law uh, which would um, uh, de uh, declare Holodomor uh, an act of genocide committed by the Soviet regime against the Ukrainian people. Uh, and this was a kind of small political crisis in Ukraine, in the parliament, it was uh, hotly debated um, and the party of regions, the communists were still very rather powerful at that time and um, acted together with the party of regions, opposed this, uh, this draft law um, <clears throat> and then it was still uh, the other political forces which uh, um, supported Yushchenko, so-called Orange Coalition, they managed to get this law through and um, uh, it, it, uh, it um, um, uh, was criticized uh, strongly by Moscow uh, and, and there was like a, uh, on diplomatic level a lot of efforts from Russia to kind of prevent this campaign which Kyiv initiated to raise international events uh, on, on the Holodomor. And then Yanukovych was elected president in 2010 and Yanukovych kind of signaled it's, we are not going to insist on genocide. And this uh, kind of satisfied uh, Moscow and Dmitry Medvedev, who was at that time president of Russia, came to Kiev and he was, he, he even visited this site as a sign of kind of reconciliation. So you, you drop genocide, we have nothing against you uh, uh, commemorating this event. <clears throat> Uh, but the second uh, topic uh, kind of uh, point of contestation in the Ukrainian-Russian relations uh, was more serious and it was the, uh, the uh, memory of the Ukrainian um, nationalism, the Ukrainian insurgent army which was uh, uh, an underground organization fighting uh, for Ukraine's independence. Um, uh, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists was created in the interwar period. The Ukrainian insurgent army already during the Second World War. And uh, in Ukraine, um, it was also a very controversial issue. Uh, because in Western Ukraine, these uh, organizations and people who fought in the Ukrainian insurgent army were kind of um, honored as heroes. People had very kind of grassroots memory of this because the members of their families were active in this underground resistance. Again, he, talking here about it is quite easy because there's some historical parallels uh, between Western Ukraine and the Baltic states in this sense. Uh, but in uh, Eastern Ukraine, for example, this was kind of um, um, hardly accepted and, and uh, people still kind of stuck to the Soviet narrative of the Great Patriotic War. Um, So it was controversial inside Ukraine and uh, of, of course critically discussed in the Ukrainian intellectual community because um, 
academic community, cultural, right? Um, because, uh, of course, uh, these uh, forces, they represented not like a democratic tradition in Ukraine, but a radical nationalist tradition. And uh, these um, organizations were implicated in um, uh, mass crimes against civilians, against Poles, also uh, the Holocaust in Ukraine. Uh, there were political forces in Ukraine which uh, demanded like official recognition of these uh, organizations as fighters for Ukrainian independence to give them official status like Armia Krajowa, for example, had in uh, Poland or um, similar organizations uh, had in, in, uh, have in the Baltic states. Um, and of course, the, first of all, the communists opposed, uh, opposed this. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Viktor Yushchenko, when he was invite, uh, elected president, he uh, made some steps in like, politically rehabilitating of the uh, own and, and um, UPA. And uh, he most controversial act was like, Awarding Stepan Bandera, the hero of Ukraine, uh, kind of title. And this was um, a food also for Russian propaganda, which kind of uh, picked this up. Uh, and again, kind of this narrative of Ukrainian fascists coming to power, rehabilitating Ukrainian rehabilitating Nazism, and um, this, this uh, uh, Russian propaganda kind of um, uh, uh, built on this. Um, so when, in 2014, um, to what extent can we say that, that uh, what happened in Ukraine you know what happened, the Euromaidan protests, which radicalized political crisis, uh, Russia's annexation of Crimea, pro-Russian mobilization in the east and, and south of Ukraine. Um, to what extent uh, memory politics played a role here? So from my perspective, the, the uh, sources of this crisis cannot be reduced to the clash of irreconcilable collective memories and historical narratives, as some scholars argue, but I believe that Ukraine's political elites uh, have instrumentalized these conflicting memories and antagonistic symbols uh, as a tool for political mobilization, and uh, it went out of control. And Russia has profited from this Ukrainian memory wars in its efforts to weaken Ukraine, to undermine Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian statehood, to prevent Ukraine's uh, reorientation uh, towards Europe. And most uh, tragically, probably, uh, what came to be uh, called Russian Spring in um, uh, uh, in the Russian media in 2014, these antagonistic narratives were weaponized by Kremlin and also Kremlin's allies in Ukraine uh, to, to fuel unrest and undermine public institutions and delegitimize the Ukrainian state. <clears throat> So when, Crimea, when Russia annexed Crimea uh, in 2014, basically all these narratives were already there. Uh, uh, and, and what we know today, or what we know today as this set of key narratives of the Russian propaganda, they could be f found already in, in Putin's speech on at the, at the occasion of the annexation of Crimea, when Euromaidan was presented as a f fascist uh, coup uh, and as a Western plot against Russia, uh, 
uh, Kremlin claimed protecting Russian speakers from radical nationalists coming to Crimea and killing Russian speaking people. Uh, Russians were presented by Putin as a divided nation. He specifically kind of addressed, uh, um, made parallels with divided Germany, saying, look, like Russians are also divided by artificial borders, post Soviet borders. Crimea was kind of an, uh, framed as, as a very important part of Russia, not geographically, but symbolically, uh, because of this connection to the origins of Russian Christianity. Prince Volodymyr was baptized in Hersones, which is on the territory of today's Sevastopol. So it's like uh, the, the origins of Russian spirituality, religion, culture, civilization, whatever. And Sevastopol is, of course, uh, takes important place in the Russian cultural and historical imagination as a city of Russian military glory. Um, so what happened after the, um, what happened after the, uh, the, um, these events in 2014, the Euromaidan and the, the annexation of Crimea and the uh, war in Donbass, which also started in spring 2014, is a kind of uh, emergence uh, of a kind of ideology or um, kind of patchwork of ideologies, narratives, symbols, I don't know how you call it, which uh, started to be put under kind of umbrella term Russian world. So what is Russian world? It, it, you know probably that it emerged as a kind of term to um, first kind of innocent term to talk about Russians living abroad, being part of Russian cultural space, uh, speaking Russian, and it has kind of developed into geopolitical doctrine uh, of Russian expansionism, uh, merging Russian imperial symbols, Soviet symbols, orthodox symbols, Russian nationalist symbols, as you can see on this poster, which says Donbass rise up. And you, you see here like an icon, iconic images from Soviet uh, and Russian, ancient Russian periods, but you also see Ukrainian riot police Berkut here, which um, were glorified in Russia as fighting Ukrainian fascists in Kyiv. <clears throat> in Ukraine too, after 2014, a lot has changed. Uh, because initially Euromaidan did not have anything to do with memory or history or even identity. It was a kind of pro-European movement. Uh, but uh, identity came to be seen through kind of anti-colonial lens. The more Russia tried to prevent this kind of uh, reorientation of Ukraine uh, towards Europe, the more in Ukraine Russia came to be seen as neo-imperial power and Yanukovych government as a kind of uh, instrument of this power. And uh, paradoxically, like Lenin's monuments came to be seen as uh, uh, symbols of this Russian neo-imperial power. I'm, saying paradoxically because Putin repeatedly uh, said that, that Ukraine is artificial state created by Lenin. So he blamed Lenin for creating Ukraine, but in Ukraine, Lenin uh, was seen, as still seen as, as, a, as a symbol of Russian imperial, uh, imperial power. And of course, the war in Donbass uh, uh, kind of legitimized uh, nationalist symbols, uh, nationalist narratives, uh, and even in Eastern Ukraine, for many people, uh, Bandera appeared as the one who was fighting Russia 
uh, like 70 years ago, uh, so uh, he w w started to be perceived as a symbol of anti-Russian resistance. And of course, uh, this kind of um, rehabilitation of nationalist symbols and narratives also served and strengthened Russian propaganda. In 2015, uh, as you know, Ukraine adopted uh, so-called decommunization laws, again, in many ways, uh, following this logic and catching up with developments uh, which happened in Eastern European countries and in Baltic states a bit earlier. Uh, most controversial was like banning uh, Soviet symbols from public space. Um, local communities were obliged to rename streets, places named after Soviet leaders. Um, and monuments had to be removed to Soviet uh, and Bolshevik leaders. And World War II came to be used as an official term instead of the Great Patriotic War. <clears throat> um, again, it's, it's a kind of paradox that uh, Putin actually launched this uh, full-scale invasion under uh, this ridiculous pretext fighting uh, Ukrainian Nazism exactly when uh, Volodymyr Zelensky uh, won presidential elections and uh, kind of um, um, signaled that, that he's not going to be a um, mnemonic warrior, yeah? That he's, he's like, um, his politics is going to be inclusive, he's, he's open for dialogue, um, in one of his speeches, he said something like, what's the difference and the, near what monument you meet your girlfriend, something like that. And this me, me, kind of meme, what's the difference, Kakaya Raznitsa, kind of followed, <laughs> followed him for, for quite some time. So he, um, he did not, um, yeah, so he did not continue the politics of Poroshenko uh, in this sense, and he also wanted to be more inclusive towards like um, Eastern Ukrainian um, electorate. Uh, so the, the Institute of National Remembrance also got a new director uh, who did not have this image of being like Ukrainian nationalist, but really, um, wanted to initiate like public dialogue on some controversial issues. Uh, so when the Russian aggression, uh, the Russian invasion happened, um, it was very different from 2014 because there was no kind of internal conflict in the Ukrainian society. There was no polarization on these historical narratives and, and um, uh, so this, this memory was uh, suddenly became kind of irrelevant uh, in, in the face of, the, of this threat to the Ukrainian uh, independence and Ukrainian statehood. <clears throat> now, um, after one year and a half, uh, almost one could give a separate lecture on what this war did to the Ukrainian-Russian relations from the perspective of memory politics, what it did to um, Ukrainian debates about um, memory, history, identity. Um, I will be very short here and maybe we could um, I'm, I'm sure there will be other discussions in, on panels and sessions. So I think first of all, we should uh, see that this, uh, this war is a huge uh, kind of challenge to um, national memory understood in a broader sense. Yeah, what is going to happen to Ukrainian museums, archives, um, on the occupied territories, on the territories affected by, by the military actions, yeah? Um, this is, 
we don't know how long this war will go on and what what um, what kind of nation emerges from this war. <clears throat> um, huge collective trauma which uh, the Ukrainian society will have to deal with for decades and already now um, there's a lot of attempts to collect testimonies, uh, to write down oral histories, uh, to collect uh, um, all kinds of materials, to document for various purposes. To, so it's, it's a field in itself. And recently I spoke with someone who kind of involved in this, and it's a, it's a very complicated and very dynamic field different organizations, journalists, uh, uh, human rights activists, volunteers, um, people with knowledge and without knowledge, documenting, collecting testimonies without knowing or not knowing how to deal with sensitive issues, with ethical issues, with data protection issues. So it's, it's really a huge challenge and um, it's, we are only in the beginning here. <clears throat> um, of course, we could talk again here for a long time about decolonization and derussification as a kind of response from below in the Russian society and, and what does it mean and um, <clears throat> there, there, there will be, there, there were uh, like hot public debates in Ukraine, for example, on Bulgakov Museum in Kyiv, how this museum should look like, if it should be there, and if yes, um, what kind of museum it should be. There was a wave of um, toppling down uh, Pushkin's monuments in Ukraine, something you can say quite controversial because Pushkin has nothing to do with this war and yet Pushkin is used by Russia as a kind of marker of Russian cultural imperial presence on the, in the post-Soviet space. Uh, so um, another topic, what Russia is doing on the newly occupied territories, we have experts here uh, and uh, I will not talk for a long time about it, but basically it's Russification, changing like place names from Ukrainian into Russian, inscribing Russian imperial symbols and narratives in the public space. It's uh, partly recommunization, uh, like some Soviet toponyms are returned to Ukrainian cities and for me, it's like an interesting question, for example, like Russians, they call Bakhmut Artyomovsk, but they do not change the name Mariupol, which was Zhdanov before. So what is behind it? And so what, what is acceptable for Russians and what is not? And uh, I think it's about, um, I don't know, Misha probably knows much better about it. So my hypothesis, it's, it's about uh, the Yevromaidan. So everything what happened after the Yevromaidan is, is a kind of illegitimate in the eyes of uh, Kremlin. So it should be, we should get back at least, they, should, they want to get back at least back to 2013, yeah? Um, Lenin, uh, Lenin's monuments, some of them were re re restored in some small cities. And again, it's an interesting question. Is it like a Russian initiative or rather initiative of some local collaborators who uh, yeah, feel like uh, some resentment about decommunization? I think it's rather the second. Uh, and, uh, and of course, this is also politics of memory. If you think what Russians are doing with Mariupol, yeah? They are kind of putting everything under plaster and, and um, 
imposing total amnesia to what happened on what happened to this city and what they did to this city. Um, very briefly, uh, of course, the, the narrative of, of the Great Patriotic War and the way how Victory Day is celebrated is something which is in the core of this conflict, right? Because of this narrative of the Ukrainian fascism and because for Russia, victory in the Second World War is such a crucial event which is the core of their, their like identity as a state and as a nation. <clears throat> um, so it's interesting, uh, again, I'm kind of don't pretend to be um, the last, to have the last word here, but to pretend how these celebrations of the Victory Day, uh, to, so, sorry, to follow, how these celebrations of the Victory Day are changing in Russia, like in, in uh, 2022, um, for, nobody came to Moscow, basically, yeah? And, and uh, for Moscow, this was always, uh, the day of kind of um, uh, a celebration to invite foreign guests. And for the leaders of the post-Soviet state, it was a moment uh, to go to Moscow and to show some kind of loyalty, right? And you remember 2005 when it was a huge issue if the leaders of the Baltic states should go to Moscow to this kind of um, anniversary to be present on the Red Square or not. Uh, so one of the consequences of this war is in, and international isolation as, is that Russia basically celebrates it with a very small number of satellites, if at all. Uh, and on the occupied territories, uh, it's basically the Soviet-style celebrations and, and uh, uh, the immortal regiment, the banner of victory, all these rituals developed in Russia in, in the post-Soviet years. Uh, so Russia is kind of trying to implement this on the occupied territories, claiming that people were denied an opportunity to celebrate Victory Day under the Ukrainian rule. Uh, it's more complicated, I think, what is happening in Ukraine uh, I think in uh, in spring 2002, for for some kind of couple of months in the beginning, it was not clear for Zelensky himself and for 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 the Ukrainian government how to frame this war and to what extent to draw on the on this uh, narrative of the Great Patriotic War. So it was some kind of temptation to call it Patriotic War to to um, uh, to borrow m maybe some symbolic elements from, from this. And for example, Zelensky um, awarded hero, hero city of Ukraine, several Ukrainian cities in, I think it was in April um, 22. And you know that hero city is a kind of Soviet title very much inscribed in this, um, uh, Soviet tradition of, of glorifying uh, the victory. There were no um, hero cities in Ukraine before, and this was a kind of controversial move, so some people criticized Zelensky and said, it's not our way of framing it, yeah? And I think he dropped it, so it was not mentioned much in the official, um, official kind of rhetoric, although the mayor of Kharkiv likes to put it on banners, Kharkiv is a hero city. Anyway, most recently uh, Zelensky signed a decree um, declaring May 9th the um, day of Europe, so it's over. So this kind of um, um, ambiguity the 8th of May, the 9th of May, for a long time it was a kind of compromise 
so we still celebrate the 9th of May, but the new holiday is the 8th of May. So now it's kind of separated um, the day of um, memory and reconciliation, I think, or remembrance is, is May uh, 8. It's very small. Yeah. Um, the, the day of memory and victory over Nazism, yeah. <clears throat> and, and the 9th of May is the day of Europe. Um, I have to uh, somehow wrap up and with some concluding remarks, uh, which is difficult in this case because we are in the uh, middle of uh, this very kind of dramatic, still unfolding uh, historical process. And first rem remark is probably coming back to the question if uh, memory politics or memory wars can explain this war. This is what I uh, like to stress is that not every memory war leads to a real war, yeah? And I think the, it can be one of the dimension of the conflict, but you know, Russia did not attack Estonia for <clears throat> uh, the controversies they had about Second World War. Ukraine and Poland did not start a war, despite the fact that there were, and still are a lot of uh, difficult issues between them on um, their past. So I, I think Ukraine, it's the reasons of this war are somewhere else, and this is the first of all from my perspective that the, the kind of unfinished architecture of European security where Ukraine found itself in a sort of gray zone which allowed Russia to attack Ukraine, and uh, also the kind of place that Ukraine takes in Russian cultural uh, and political imagination as part of the Russian civilization. This is different from other cases, from the Baltic states probably. Uh, so don't blame only like politicians who, who kind of provoked Moscow with their unwise memory politics. <clears throat> um, there's kind of ongoing debate if the Putin's regime is fascist, is it neo-fascist, is it Sovietist, neo-Soviet, and so on. I don't have kind of something to say on this, but I think what we learned uh, from what happened until today is that the anti-fascist narratives, actually what always considered in Europe like leftist, they can be weaponized uh, to justify military aggression and they can be merged with imperial ones. And this is something I think in Europe we should somehow think about because we often in the European debates on memory politics, the danger is always from the, from the right. Yeah? So right-wing um, narratives about the past kind of justifying um, nationalism, justifying uh, kind of whitewashing collaborators and so on. But we saw that narratives which political actors claim to be anti-fascist can, can also uh, be instrumentalized for uh, justifying the war. And the last comment probably, uh, it concerns Europe, uh, uh, and it concerns the way how this war will be remembered, not only in Ukraine, but in Europe, and what it will do, this experience, uh, what it will do uh, to the European identity and the political project of Europe based on, as it was already mentioned here, never again. On this photo you see um, shoes which Ukrainian activists brought uh, to the um, embankment uh, of Danube, 
in Budapest, and this is a famous Holocaust memorial, the, these bronze shoes of the Holocaust victims on, on the embankment, and, and they, uh, on the, on the um, like last dates of the siege of Mariupol, um, Ukrainian activists brought the shoes to remind about civilian victims dying in Mariupol, and kind of also drawing this parallel and evoking this um, um, reference. So I leave this question open, and thank you very much for your attention. So thank you so much, Tatiana, for your rich uh, overview um, introduction to the conference. Um, so questions to Tatiana. Um, and please uh, raise a hand so that our students can bring you the mic. So, Tatiana, thank you very much um, for this overview. You started your lecture by saying that this is not really a territorial dispute and this is not really a memory war. And then you went on uh, to describe how it is a memory war in many ways. And I think one of the, the great services that you did by doing that is to make this war in its memory aspects comparable to other conflicts. So now that we have this broad image of what the memory conundrum is in this war. We can think about how this war is similar or different from other conflicts in the world in the other periods. Could you do the same for the territorial aspect, <laughs> which you said is also a non-aspect? Um, I'm asking because, I mean, I sympathize with what you said, right? It's, it, it feels strange to say that this is a territorial dispute because it's so obvious how Russia's territorial pretensions are ludicrous. But at the same time, it is um, something that I would call a case of imperial irredentism, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's an empire, a former empire, trying to reconstitute at least part of its, its mm -hmm. imperial territory uh, by you know, conquering. And in that particular aspect, I think it's not entirely different from other cases that we've had in the past of colonial wars, imperial wars, etc. So, in one minute, <laughs> could you do for the territorial and the kind of territorial mnemonic aspect mm. what you did for the memory aspect? Uh, thank you, Misha. This is a very good question, but again, very difficult to, to answer in brief. Um, I'm saying it's not a territorial dispute because for me territorial dispute is something like two, two states, they, they have kind of clearly defined uh, piece of land, they cannot somehow agree for some reasons whom it belongs. But in, in this case, it's like, it's changing, like it depends how far Russian army gets uh, they change their claims, right? So if they would take Kharkiv, they would say today Kharkiv is Russian. Yeah? And so this is probably the, the first level of, uh, the first kind of aspect of my answer. But, but you, you are right, of course, that in, um, it, it, it is partly about this territorial expansionism. No, I think, so for, for Russia, it's like they have Belarus under control, they don't have to annex it. And what they, so there are different ways to control uh, and to, to spread your influence, right? So it's uh, territorial dispute is something very kind of concrete, right? It can be solved. But I don't know how this can be solved because they don't know themselves how much of Ukraine they want. I have rather minor question, not so pretentious. Uh, I just want to know whether this aggressive uh, rhetoric 
against uh, Baltic states is a product of Putin's regime or whether we can find some roots of it uh, in the Yeltsin regime already. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, um, I'm not really an expert on um, the Russian-Baltic relations, but I think uh, uh, it, it was there already in the 90s, and it was, uh, there were enough political actors uh, uh, in, in, in um, Kremlin or in, in the Russian parliament already in the 90s who uh, kind of, uh, yeah, voiced this, this narrative of what is happening in the Baltic states is, is a kind of rehabilitation of Nazism and, and uh, of course, it was combined with this rhetoric of protecting Russian speakers, and and uh, and still, um, Moscow did not go so far to kind of, um, uh, yeah, escalate this. Right. I have a question. Um, hello, Tatiana. Um, I'm interested in uh, changing the vernacular uh, meanings of the concept of the Russian world in Ukraine. I know that you are dealing with this topic, and um, do they still is exist? I mean, uh, the, the meanings of the Russian world in Ukraine, and uh, how they have been changing since the war, since, since the beginning of the war. Thank you. I, yeah, it's... Uh, it's actually a question I was asking myself because I was uh, doing research uh, looking at civilizational narratives in, in uh, Kharkiv as a border region. And uh, I, uh, I was asking people about how would they um, understand under, uh, the Russian world, yeah, but the, um, it has become impossible since February uh, 22 to talk about Russian world in um, in, a, in other sense than just a kind of synonym for the Russian aggression. Yeah, so uh, um, or Russian hybrid aggression. Yeah, uh, like Russian cultural influence in Ukraine actors like the Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine being one of the actors of this influence. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's very difficult to, um, I think, to, uh, to find other meaning of this rather than kind of uh, a synonym for the Russian aggression. Uh, thank you, Professor Zhuzhenka, for this enlightening talk. Um, I uh, would like to ask you to reflect on what seems to be a, a kind of a shifting framework for understanding uh, memory wars and uh, memory politics in uh, between, I guess, between uh, Russia and uh, the Baltics and Eastern Europe, uh, where uh, before we used to talk about uh, po post-communist, right, and uh, the idea was... Uh, that uh, the newly independent republics and countries uh, have been repudiating uh, the legacy of totalitarianism, right? And uh, now what seems to be happening is, is kind of a shift toward a post-colonial or decolonial uh, narrative. Uh, what do you see, do you see this as any, in any way problematic uh, in the way that we are, you know, collectively, um, dealing with the with the legacy of post-communism uh, and totalitarianism. Um, so I, I would like for you to maybe reflect a little bit on this. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, this is the, I think one of those questions we will discuss a lot during this conference. Um, honestly, <laughs> I myself, um, um, yeah, it's a big question, and I, I did not kind of un 
participate in this debate on decolonization uh, for the reason that there are enough people who are involved in this and have this background. Um, I personally see a um, kind of problem here because uh, Ukraine is, is claiming to be like, to be part of Europe, yeah? uh, kind of reclaiming its European identity. And it's a very important narrative in, in Ukraine. Yeah? And um, like being at the same time uh, kind of trying to um, embrace this narrative of decolonization, to some extent I see a contradiction here. So I don't know how we will deal with this and how it will be it, but I think a lot is, is now changing. And actually, in Ukraine, I think it's a very interesting debate that, that suddenly this kind of decolonization narrative, it was before in Ukraine, you could find it by Mykola Repchuk, by some Ukrainian intellectuals, but it was not like something um, uh, kind of mainstream. But now it is mainstream. and. I think what is interesting that suddenly it's a new topic in Ukraine. Uh, so the, the, the countries of the third world, the, the countries which have also like this colonial uh, legacy, uh, how Ukraine, how could it happen that Ukraine actually had, has no understanding uh, what is going on in this uh, global South, right? That Ukraine has no um, or little expertise on this, that, that it's all kind of monopolized by Russia because Russia presents itself as a, uh, as a successor of the Soviet Union and uh, um, a f f kind of uh, uh, liberator of the colonial nations from imperialism, yeah? And uh, I think it's, it's a kind of um, interesting debate happening now in Ukraine, which uh, for me is, a, for the first time, is a kind of change of perspective, that Ukraine starts to see itself not only as a kind of potentially European nation, which is underestimated and not accepted, into this European club of, yeah, but also uh, as a country which has something to, in common with, with um, post-colonial states. And I think it's interesting. Uh, but I think we are only in the beginning of this. And of course, um, yeah. I think we will have tomorrow, uh, um, also kind of discussion on this. Um, I think it's a big topic. I'm kind of, <laughs> yeah, not ready to elaborate more on this. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tatiana. Um, we have to stop here.